you know, last night uh, we were riding home from Lexington and it was dark, of course. And Bun and I were talking about getting dark early and, you know, you're not getting the vitamin D this time of year we normally get. And uh, as I was thinking about communion today and the message of hope, I was thinking about the season that's upon us. Thanksgiving kind of kicks off the Christmas season, the holiday season, and you usually think of a time of joy and bright lights and the happiness, but a lot of times we forget it's also a season for a lot of sadness, depression, anxiety, loneliness if you're missing family. And Thursday at Thanksgiving, a family member that works at Crown Recovery and he wasn't there because Wednesday night they had 28 new people come into Crown Recovery for addiction recovery. That's the reality that this time of year also brings. But we have hope. Those men have hope. And it's in these cups that we're getting ready to take today. The blood and the body it was broken for us so that we could have hope. And Psalms tells us, Psalms 42 tells us, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Isaiah 40, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So this holiday season, as you go through, think about those around you and what they may be going through. If they don't have hope, if they don't know who Jesus is, maybe they're depressed, anxious, overwhelmed to where they're going to buy the Christmas gifts, find the next money to buy the meal for Christmas. Reach out to those and offer them hope. Share Jesus' love with them. And remember your own times, because we all go through the times that are not the best, that we all have that hope and that promise of eternal life. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to you, we thank you, God, for the hope that each and every one of us are given. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken on that cross so that our sins can be forgiven and we may have eternal life. Father, just be with us. Be with the rest of the service. Be with Warren as he brings us the message. Just guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray.
Good morning, Cornerstone. How's everybody doing this morning? The three of you that are doing good, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm hoping the rest of you uh, will, will, will be jumping up and down and shouting with joy uh, by the time we're ready to leave this morning. You know, it's, it's good to be able to join together in the house of the Lord, to be able to celebrate and to think about the hope that we have because of the grace and the love that God has showered upon us in his, the gift of his son, Jesus. And today starts a, a new series for us as we move into the Christmas season. We're going to be talking about the idea of being delivered. Uh, I, I'll bet that you've got a few things for being delivered at your house. Right now, if you were to come to my steps, it seems like every day there's another cardboard box. Usually it has that little smile on the bottom of it there. Uh, and it's, they're always just popping in. There's so many things there. And I'm guessing that somewhere there is something that you want delivered this Christmas. What's on your wish list? You know, it's what we had our kids do is they fill out a wish list and they'll send it to us and we get to see what they want and then we know that we're getting something they actually desire for Christmas. And, and I wonder what's on your wish list this Christmas. Actually, more specifically, do you have hope on your wish list this Christmas? See, a lot of times we, we look for other things, but we don't always think about those things that are most important to us. And one thing that we all need is hope. It's even good to be able to share hope with others. Uh, for the, my, my birthday was last month. Was it Monday? Last Monday, I think it was. Uh, anyway, this last week. And uh, Billy and Nicole uh, got me this box of soap from Dr. Squash that were all uh, Star Wars themed. And there were some great soaps in there. There was the Dark Side Scrub, Darth Vader themed. There was the Yoda themed Wisdom Wash. But one of them was called the Only Hope Soap. And then I got to thinking... We spent a lot of time together after Thanksgiving last year building the stage and doing all that. And this year they give me soap <laughs> as we get ready to go into building the stage for this year's Christmas. I'm wondering, are, what are, what's their hope in giving me this uh, for a birthday present? But, you know, we, you know, hope is so important. And the only hope soap might help make for a sweeter smelling Christmas, but the real solution is to know your true source of hope. And hope is so much more than just hope. A wish. I mean, we all make wishes, but we don't make plans based on what we wish. You see, hope is, is, is so much more. A lot of us are, we make wishes all the time. We wish we had more money. Uh, we, we wish we had more time that we could spend with family. We wish uh, that we had more successes to look back on in life. We wish we had all of these things. There's always more. But when, when we wish, there's not really an expectation that those things are going to happen. Most of the time, what we wish for are the things we don't expect would ever happen. Uh, a wish is almost the opposite uh, of, a, of really having hope. And see, hope has this element of expectation Hope, if you were to define it from the Greek, is this confident expectation in something good. And it's the foundation of your dreams for a future. And what you're going to experience one day coming up, what you hope for is so important and you need hope. You need hope in order to take the next step towards whatever it is that you desire in your future. And if you don't have hope, then what ends up happening is we stop really living and just begin to exist. Are any of you there? Have you lost hope? You know, you stop trying because the expectation of failure can become just a sign of incapacitating in life. You, you don't believe things are going to work out. You can't imagine a better future. You just don't know how things would be. And failure just looms so heavy. And, and yes, failure is a possibility in life. This is one of the reasons I'm so thankful for our men's study on Wednesday night is we were talking about failure is a fact of life, but it doesn't have to be a way of life. You see, we're going to fail, and the only person who never fails is the one who never tries, or Jesus. You're not Jesus, so the only way you're not going to fail is if you never try. And the saddest thing is for a person to not try and fail, but for them to fail to try. I fear far too many people are going to face death with the realization that they never really lived because they didn't make the effort, they didn't really try, at least not like they should have. And it's all because we don't live with hope. Without hope, we lose our purpose, we'll lose our drive. And, and the simple truth is, without hope, we die. It may only be on the inside. But so many people are dead because they have no hope. 
the truth is they're afraid to have hope because their hopes have failed so many times in the past. But here's the thing. That happens because we put our hope in the wrong things. When we put our hope in the wrong things, it's always going to come up short. Every couple of years, you'll have a politician offering to be your source of hope, how they have a plan that's going to make things better. And, and here's the thing. Maybe some things will get better, but some things are going to get worse. That's the curse of a fallen world. That's just the way it is. And no politician, no matter how well-intentioned, is going to be able to make the world a perfect place. But here's the thing. You can't give up. You've still got to have hope for the government. And many of us have put hope in our relationships or in our marriages. But every relationship will have its problems. I heard about a man and woman who went in for counseling and they were asked to write down the things that they were disappointed in in their relationship. And, and the wife said, well, I was only able to write down two things. And the man thought, that's not too much to be disappointed in. He said, the counselor asked him, would you read it? And he said, sure. She said, sure. And, and uh, she said, everything he does and everything he says. <laughs> You know, I hope that you're not at that point in your relationship. I mean, no marriage is going to be perfect. They all struggle. But it's essential that you have hope for your marriage. And some of us ha have put our hopes in our careers or in our health. Some people are, are putting hope in their church. And those hopes will help you. you. They'll help you get the job done with joy. They'll help you keep living each day to the fullest. And those hopes can even help you keep serving when you question if what you're doing is really going to make a difference. But here's the thing. <clears throat> hope for the government isn't in politicians. And hope for your marriage isn't founded in your spouse. And hope for your career, health, and church isn't in what you do. Your only hope is being delivered in Jesus. See, Jesus is the hope of Christmas, and he's the source of really all true hope in life. Everything and everyone else in this world will probably let you down at some point. Unfortunately, no matter how much we try to overcome our sinful selfishness, we are just that. We're still sinful and selfish. But God isn't like that. He isn't limited in that way. Jesus says that you're so incredibly valuable to God that we can trust him to give us what we need. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, don't be naive as you read that and think that God is, that Jesus is telling you that God's your Santa Claus, bringing good gifts to all the good boys and girls, and that, that's the way this works. This isn't, that isn't what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is doing is he's explaining that God will bring you the things that will truly bring you the greatest joys in life. So often the problem is we look for things in this world to somehow bring us joy. But those things can only bring a temporary happiness. They're not going to fill us, and they won't make us better. It's only in Jesus that we find that. And it isn't that God doesn't want you to have a, a nice boat or a new car. It's just that he knows those things don't really matter when it comes to the end of life and the truly important things. And when it comes to what you truly, really need you can trust and put your full hope in God because he will provide. He's already given you what you need most. He gave it to us in his son Jesus when he sent him to die in our place for our sins and offer salvation and exchange his righteousness for our sinfulness. And when we put our faith in Christ, you get to become God's child and he's going to be with you in every situation that you face. That's part of the promise of 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17 where we're encouraged. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and wonderful hope comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. See, we have this wonderful hope and it's intended for every day of life and every situation that you encounter. It's not just someday off in, the, off in the future. It's not just for when you meet God at the gates of heaven. It's for today. Every situation that you face, even when it seems hopeless, God has promises. For instance, remember the story of Abraham 
when he was nearly 100 years old and his wife Sarah was 90 and still barren, yet God had made the promise that Abraham would be the father of many nations. He would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. It seemed impossible at 190. How could this be? But as Paul reminds us in, in Romans 4, he says, Against all odds, when it looked hopeless, Abraham, in hope, believed the promise of God and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word. I want, I want to know, can you do that today? Abraham hoped, even when there was no hope, he activated that hope because he was convinced that God had the power to do whatever was needed. And that promise was fulfilled. You know, another time I, I remember it, it goes so well with this season when who could blame young Mary for being fearful when the angel appeared to her and said, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You know, if an angel appeared and started to talk to you, you'd probably be afraid too. And I, I, some people have said that it was because angels were so incredible that it was a fearful sight. And that may be true. But I wonder sometimes if the angels say, I'll tell Mary, hang on. And don't be afraid when you hear what God's got to tell you. He says, you'll be with child and give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus. And I kind of wonder if Mary's fear may have been more from what God told her that she was going to do. Because for Mary and her culture, that was a death sentence. She could be stoned for having sex outside of marriage. And she was certainly going to have a hard time explaining to her fiancé how she ended up pregnant. Everything in her life was crashing down, and, and she questioned, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And so the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born to you will be called the Son of God. And then he gave her an example. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary trusted God, and she said, let it be to me as you said. But she had to put her trust in God, believing that nothing was impossible for him, believing that God would provide for her, not knowing how Joseph might respond. And he responded as you might expect. He decided to divorce her and put her away quietly, and he was doing that out of the kindness of his heart until God stepped in and intervened and changed his mind. And he changed hearts. But Mary's hope wasn't in Joseph. It wasn't that Joseph would take care of her if God did what he said he would do. She trusted God to take care of her. And Abraham's hope wasn't in his 100-year-old body, but it was in the Lord. You see, nothing is impossible with God. And I don't know what you might be going through, but you need to keep your hope in him and in his righteous ways. Because when you begin to suffer in hope, and waiting for the things to come, that's when Satan will often attack. We see that happen in Abraham's life in Genesis 16, 2. It shows where Abraham tried to fulfill God's promise in a worldly way by having, uh, by using Sarah's handmaiden as a, as a substitute in order to have a child. And what it brought was heartache. Jeremiah is a prophet who's known as the weeping prophet, and he knew the pain and struggle of remaining in hope. God called him... To, to be there to speak to the people of Israel from even before the time Jeremiah was born. And for 40 years, this prophet of God spoke truth and he preached to people and, and he battled for the righteousness of the people against the sinful choices that they were making. All in the hope that spiritual renewal might come into their lives, but all his efforts were for, for nothing. And Lamentations gives this picture of his grief. He says, I've cried until the tears no longer come. I've cried until I can't cry anymore. Maybe you've been there too. Maybe there's a child who's strayed. Maybe there's a relationship that's broken. Maybe there's fear in your life about how you're going to be able to provide. But we hit that point where our hope seemed broken and dashed. But I love what Jeremiah chose to do. In Lamentations 3, he says, This is, was what I was thinking until I chose to focus my thoughts. And he says, But this I call to mind. I force myself to remember this. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Not in what everybody else in the culture is doing. Not because everybody else is choosing to do the right things, but because God is faithful. And when the struggles of life are hitting so hard, remember that your hope is in Jesus and he's using these things to shape you to become more like him. Your hope can't be in somebody else if they'll become what they're supposed to be. You need to take the situation you're in and allow God to use it to shape you to be like Jesus. And that is our hope. When your hope is in Jesus, he begins to shape you. See, in Matthew 14, Jesus actually instructs his apostles to go across the lake. And while they're out in the middle of the lake, Jesus has stayed on the shore to pray. But on, as they're out in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the night, I can't imagine how dark it would have been at this point in time. But a windstorm came up and the waves began so bad that the, they were afraid that the boat was going to sink. They were frightened. And they, were, they, they, they didn't know what to do. And in that moment, the disciples' hope faltered because of their fear and their insecurity. But their hope was renewed when Jesus came walking out on the water, and then he calmed the storm. I may have just switched two of those stories around. I don't know if you know that I've realized that, but the point is still the same. When Jesus was awakened, he calmed the storm. But it's, sometimes, you know, we think about the storms of life and we realize where we are and we feel the wind and the waves and, and we're scared and in the midst of our insecurities, we begin to fear. I believe the disciples went to Jesus while he was asleep in the boat and they said, Lord, don't you care that we're about to die? Don't you care that we're about to drown? I want you to remember this. That the same God who calmed the storm is the one who called them into the storm. Jesus has sent them there. And the storms that you're going through in your life may very well be exactly where God has called you. And problems don't mean that God has abandoned you. Rather, it's, it's the simple fact that God has purpose in every storm. And it's often in the struggles that God reveals himself to us in a way that we never have known him otherwise. It's only as we face great problems that we turn to God for the strength that we need. And it's in these struggles that God draws us nearer to himself and shapes us to be more like Jesus. You see, hope is simply the practice of believing that God's going to get you from here to where he wants you to be. Hope in Jesus moves us beyond the disappointments of today and it offers a confident hope for the possibilities of tomorrow because hope is a person and he walks with you each and every day no matter what you might be encountering. And Jesus is our greatest hope. And no matter what we face in this world, our hope is still in Jesus because he has overcome the world. And so I want, to re want you to remember these promises. I'd encourage you to commit them to memory if you can. Work at it. It's worth it. Because in Romans 8.31, we are simply promised that if God is for us, who can stand against us? Who can be against us? When God's on your side, you don't have to worry about the size of the giant. But just remember the size of your God. In Philippians 2.13, we're told it is God who works in us to will and act according to his good purpose. God doesn't even leave it on you to be able to be good enough. He comes to live within you so that he can shape you and make you and give you the strength you need so that you can be who he's called you to be. It is God who works in you to act according to his purpose. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, Paul here writes, as We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And that's that one day we're going to see God in all of his glory and recognizing what God had done through Jesus. But he says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Hang on to your hope. <laughs> Because hope comes, you'll notice, at the end of that process. And I don't know about you, but I feel kind of stuck in the middle of that process. 
sufferings, trying to persevere, developing some character, then I'm holding out and hoping for more hope this Christmas. I need some hope delivered this Christmas. But it isn't going to be in any box. You can't find it on Amazon and no wish list is ever going to be able to fulfill it. You see, I think that we're, we're, we're revealed through Scripture where we can find that hope. And we know that Jesus is the source of that hope, but Hebrews 10 closes with a few encouragements to the church family. And, and beginning in verse 22, we, we kind of read a way that we can build our hope. And he begins each one of these statements with, let us. And so I want you to understand that it's not something that just I can do by myself. It's not something that you can do by yourself. It is something that you need others surrounding you to be able to do this. And so as the writer of Hebrews speaks to the Christians as a group and as to a church, he encourages, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and in full assurance of faith. So let us spend time with God. Secondly, he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Let's be reminded of God's faithfulness. See how many times he can and has in the past and know that he can in the future. That God is for us and not against us. And let's look at what he's done and, and understand that he still works miracles today and he will work miracles in your life if you will hold out hope and allow him to shape you to be like Jesus. Then he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. This spurring one another on is, is about having a close Christian friend that we can confide in, that we can talk to, someone who, you ever been spurred? I, I, I personally haven't, uh, but I've been kicked before, and it's kind of the same idea without the sharp pointy thing. And, and, and usually it makes me move. And what he's saying is that we need, to, we need to give each other a little kick in the pants sometimes to do what we need to get done. To consider how we continue to grow towards love and good deeds. And what he's saying is we need to hold each other accountable. To share our burdens and our joys because in doing so we share our hope. And then he says in verse 25, let us not give up meeting get together as some are in the habit of doing. You see, your presence here as a part of the church family is important to your experience of hope in life, to your experience of Jesus. And placing value of being with your church family is so important, and I want to encourage you to place that value on it this Christmas season. It's so important to the hope that all of us share. And then he says, let us encourage one another. And the need to do that all the more as we see the final day approaching. God has called us to do and to be more, but not just individually. He says, let us. And Jesus is our hope. So let us reflect that hope to each other. See, you can deliver hope this year for Christmas. Just as God delivered hope to us through Jesus you can deliver hope to others in the way that you love and treat and what you do. Imagine if all of us made an effort to deliver hope to others by being more like Jesus. In some capacity, in some way, that we would take the time out of our schedule, out of our life, to invest in another. To be like Jesus. Imagine if you chose for the next month through this Christmas season to be like Jesus to your spouse. What if you chose to be like Jesus to your next door neighbor? You'll deliver hope into your marriage. You'll deliver hope into your community. So let me just encourage you to be like Jesus and deliver hope. <clears throat> Romans 15, 13 is a prayer. And this is what Paul prays. Now may God the inspiration and fountain of hope fill you to overflowing with an uncontainable joy and a perfect peace as you trust in Him. And may the power of His Holy Spirit continually surround your life with this super abundance until you radiate with hope. And 
That's my prayer for you. May God fill you with His Holy Spirit that you radiate with hope as we come into this Christmas season. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. We know, Father, that, that you can do all things, that there's nothing that's impossible for you, that you have greater plans than we can begin to comprehend or understand or see in the world around us. But, Father, we also know that you have called us to your righteous ways. It's Satan sometimes that will try to deceive us and get us to go about things in worldly ways that... Rather than bringing honor and glory and rather than bringing the, the blessings that you intend for us, Father, we put our hope in the things of this world. And those things always let us down. So, Father, I pray that each and every one of us would find our hope in Christ alone. That we would see what you have done. That we would examine the evidence that surrounds us and that, Lord, we will celebrate this Christmas, the hope that is delivered in Jesus. We don't need to wait for a present under the tree. And we don't need to wait till someday in the future to begin to be like Jesus and deliver and share hope with others. Lord, we love you. And we pray that the hope of Christ will reign in our hearts for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. We invite you to stand with us, and as we sing this final song today, we're going to sing about the evidence of God and how it surrounds us that we should be able to have hope. And if you if you need to take a step like Chad and Daniel did today, that of just giving your life to Christ, there's water in the baptistry. We can do it today. If you want to talk this week, you can talk to me then. I'm going to ask a couple of our elders to step back by the glass doors, and, and they'll be there to talk with you about whatever you might be going through, because you may be in a spot right now where you just need someone to come alongside that we let us encourage each other. And they're there to share hope, the hope that is ours in Christ. Let's continue to praise Him. Let's recognize what He deserves and how great He is, for He is all that we need. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring, and every season from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of. Thank you.
here. And I pray that the hope of what Christ has done will go with you each and every day this week, that you can share hope with others. A couple of closing announcements just to let you know about. Uh, thank you all again. I want to just let you know there were a total of 124 boxes that were packed for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, and so thank you for that. Also, um, did we get more angel tree tags this week? I have five. There are five, five angel more. tree tags that we were able to get. We had several people. They were all taken last Sunday, so we had some people ask. Um, so if you'll see Nicole, she has five more angel tree tags you can get. Um, also, if you want to be a part of the gingerbread house making afternoon, um, let us know today. Be sure to sign up so that we can get a gingerbread house for you and your family. Otherwise, just be uh, bring one with you on the 5th. That's next Sunday. Uh, and if you would like to help and stay with uh, you can stick around for a light lunch with some appetizers. See Melissa today at the Welcome Center back there. Um, or you can just be back next Sunday afternoon for the gingerbread house making at 1230. Um, and if uh, I'm reading this for the first time, but if you want Melissa to turn in your angel tree tags gifts, please bring them next Sunday or to, uh, or else you'll need to take them to the extension office by the 10th. So thank you. Uh, Melissa's back there. If you're not sure, we need to thank Melissa Burke. She does so many things behind the scenes. Thank you. Uh, she is truly a servant, uh, and, and we love her so much. And so thank you all for being here today. I pray that the hope of Christmas will go with you and we'll continue to celebrate the gift that Christ has given to us and the hope that we have over the next few weeks. Have a blessed afternoon, and we'll see you Wednesday night at uh, 6 o'clock for a meal or next Sunday. Thank you.